Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Igor Kutsenok, and I live in California. So right now it's two o'clock in the morning in my part of the world. So this is why I'm recording this presentation. Uh, first, I would like to thank my colleagues in Ukraine for inviting me to share with you some thoughts. I would like to congratulate them um, with the inauguration of the Ukrainian chapter of the ISAP, International Society of Substance Use Professionals, which I think is a great accomplishment by, by the colleagues in Ukraine. Uh, the, uh, and, and again, this, this is a great privilege and great pleasure. It's just unfortunately because of the virus, we cannot do it in person. Uh, it's very unfortunate, something that I, I'm sorry about, but we are trying to, to do the best we can. So what I would like to share with you has something to do with our, with the primary functions of the International Technology Transfer, Transfer Center that we are running in Ukraine. Uh, and Dr. Irina Pinchuk is the Ukrainian director and Dr. Yulia Yachnik is the Ukrainian program coordinator for this project. Our primary function is training, education, and building competent workforce in addiction medicine at every level, not just physicians, not just medical professionals, psychiatrists, or psychologists, but actually at every level of, uh, of the issue because so many people are involved in addiction treatment, addiction prevention, uh, and recovery support and many other aspects of substance use disorders. As a way of getting started, I would like to uh, offer you a hypothetical. Imagine you are a prime minister of a country X, and you just got a report, a reliable report, suggesting that only 20% of patients with diabetes in your country are getting any form of treatment meaning 80% of patients with diabetes never get any treatment. And among this 20% who are getting treatment, typically the treatment starts when uh, their kidneys already failed, uh, they're blind, uh, and their legs are amputated because of the complications of diabetes. So what would you do as a prime minister of the country X? I know what I would do. I would do two things immediately. First, I would fire the Minister of Health right away. And secondly, I would demand a significant investment and significant attention to the education and training in early detection and early interventions in people with diabetes. So we will be able to prevent the complications from happening and we will be able to detect and cover with treatment as many diabetes patients as possible. So everything I'm saying makes perfect sense in my mind, not just from the medical perspective, but from even from the common sense perspective. Okay. Unfortunately, in addiction treatment, this is exactly what is happening all over the world, not just in Ukraine, not just in the United States, it, it is happening all over the world. Because unfortunately, nobody get, gets fired, no minister of health, at least to my knowledge, got fired for not offering treatment to people who could have been treated much before the severe complications happened. Look at the epidemiology. Approximately 70 to 75% of the population, these are people who do not have any problems with substances. They either have very low risk for substance use disorders or they, they don't use drugs or alcohol at all. So in this population, we don't actually need much in interventions. We just need to do some typical prevention to prevent it from happening. And that's about it. We have a relatively sizable population of people, 20 to 25%. These are people who already have some relationship and some difficulties relevant to drugs and alcohol. Uh, the difficulties are not very severe yet. Uh, the, these are people who will never 
show up in a psychiatric office, or, uh, but they are very likely to be in touch with their primary healthcare system or primary physician, primary care doctors or nurses. So these are people who already have some challenges, but the challenges are not severe yet. Uh, and th these are people who typically don't go to an addiction psychiatrist or any kind of mental health professional. And we also have approximately five to 10% of people who already developed severe, medium to severe substance use disorders with lots of complications, both individual, physiological, and psychosocial. Here's what happens in addiction treatment world all over the world. We actually don't pay much attention to these two populations. These are people who are usually are not getting any treatment and very rarely get any meaningful intervention. And unfortunately, most of our attention is focused on this population. These are people with very significant difficulties and significant biological and psychosocial complications as a result of their medium to severe substance use disorders. Would you expect very good and very promising therapeutic and recovery management outcomes in the population since we missed the opportunity to intervene here. And now with all the complications and all the challenges that these people are already experiencing, now we start treatment with sometimes strange expectation that this treatment will be effective or will result in significant positive changes, both biologically and psychosocially. No one, no minister of health actually got fired for the picture that I just presented you. And again, let me tell you, this is not just in Ukraine. We, we see this all over the world. The, uh, one of the big questions <clears throat> is, is it worth doing addiction treatment even from, from the cost effectiveness perspective? In the United States, the annual cost of substance use and problems related to substance use is $440 billion. Just to put it in the perspective, the cost of Iraq and Afghanistan wars combined is less than that. In other words, we are losing more money for problems relevant to drug and alcohol use in the United States every year. The amount of money is significantly larger than the cost of the two wars in Afghanistan and in Iraq. So one of the questions is, is it really make sense? Does it make sense from the cost effectiveness and from even from financial perspective to invest money in addiction treatment? Because sometimes people say, yeah, it's always, it, it's all nice, but we don't have money to do that. Yes, it is. Because if you look at the data, cost effectiveness analysis, effectiveness analysis the data shows that every dollar invested in addiction treatment actually had saved six and a half to seven dollars. Believe me, colleagues, even the greediest Wall Street banks would consider this a wonderful return to the investment. One to seven is a very good return of your money. So definitely investing time and finances and resources into addiction treatment, even from the cost effectiveness analysis makes perfect sense. And here is what we have in terms of one of the reasons why people who could have been treated, typically they, we miss the opportunity to treat them in time. Well, unfortunately, I need to show with you a couple of bad news coming from a study from Columbia University. And their, their, their findings, by the way, they're consistent with findings from other similar studies. The funding findings show that more than 50% of doctors actually did not address substance use at all with their patients, doctors in primary healthcare environment. More than 40% of patients actually reported the physicians actually did miss the diagnosis of substance use disorder because they've never asked this question. Even when physicians in primary healthcare settings, even if they found something that resembles substance use disorder, they typically do not include patients in the decision-making or some form of, some form of uh, treatment engagement, treatment-seeking engagement. When the physicians, the primary healthcare physicians have been asked 
actually less than 20% of them said that they're, they feel competent to talk about drug and alcohol use with their patients. So folks, please pay attention to that. So when we say that physicians do not even ask this question in many instances, in more than 50% of cases, most likely this is not because they don't know that they need to ask these questions or explore this area of physical and mental health. Most likely this is because they are afraid and they don't know what to do if the answer is a yes. So what's next? This is something that we definitely need to be very careful and we need to in increase the amount of training if we don't want to end up with a situation like I gave you as an example at the beginning, the situation with diabetes. What are the most typical reasons why physicians are not particularly interested in asking questions about drug and alcohol use? Well, there are a couple of reasons. Uh, sometimes they just, they're lacking knowledge and clinical skills. And it's not their fault, it's our fault because we did not train them well enough. Another very important reason for uh, not even addressing this issue is the typical negative attitude towards substance use disorders. The physicians and the doctors and, and healthcare practitioners are part of the general mainstream society. And all of the phenomenon that we're observing in the society, they're typical for the physicians as well. So the negative attitude is very, very common all over the world, including in Ukraine. Also, even if medical students and medical trainees have been exposed to patients with substance use disorders, usually they see patients at the end stage of the addiction with severe problems. They rarely get the exposure to patients in primary healthcare settings, patients who still do not have severe problems, but they already have some difficulties with substance use. And many studies have shown that if we are capable to improve our training in medical schools, that will actually result in significant improvement in treatment outcomes when these people become physicians or nurses or medical practitioners and start seeing and treating patients. We also know from the research, multiple studies, that skill-based training curricula, meaning curricula that involve not just talking about something, but practicing different new skills, this type of curricula are significantly more effective than just didactic lecturing or telling people what to do. We also know that in uh, medical universities or nursing schools or social work schools, having at least one faculty member who is competent in addiction medicine will significantly increase the outcomes, treat, the training outcomes in the students. And we also know that when we combine and interact the expertise, uh, combine the expertise with didactic and interactive lectures and practical exercises with, uh, with coaching and mentoring of the students, that will result in a sustainable long-term changes, positive changes. In the, primary, uh, in the primary care, this is exactly the environment, the primary health care delivery system. These are the places where people with some initial difficulties or initial low severity substance use disorders will end up seeking help for all sorts of problems, not for substance use per se. They can come to a physician with high blood pressure or a headache or weight loss or something else, something that is pretty common, pretty common reasons, some of the common reasons for people to seek medical help. This is exactly the right place to detect the problem and to start intervening. Um, the, and interestingly enough, sometimes physicians say, well, we don't ask because even if we do ask, they're not gonna tell us. The studies by the Columbia University and some other studies, actually they've shown that these are patients who will never tell you unless you ask. If you ask, Actually, more than 70% of them will tell you the truth, that they do have some challenges with alcohol, they do have some problems with tobacco use, and they do have some problems with probably some other drug use. So if you don't ask, they won't tell. But if you do ask, they're likely to tell you, and that might be a good opportunity to initiate significant conversation. We talked about the possible barriers. Why? We are not very good in training our medical professionals in addiction medicine. In addition to that, even if when in some schools, even when we do train people, 
in medical schools, we don't necessarily train them in implementing evidence-based and science-driven methods of treatment. This is just a pyramid of how much, how much, how great is the reliability of different scientific methods to establish evidence-based practices, and then we'll start training people in doing this type of work. Let's go back to the same slide. The reason why we do have the ISAP chapter in Ukraine, the reason why Ukraine is one of the members of the International Consortium of Universities on Drug Demand Reduction, the reason why, thank God, the, the United States State Department supported the development of the International Technology Transfer Center in Ukraine that was formerly, we knew it as, as an addiction technology transfer center that was operational since 2017 in Ukraine. The reasons for having all of these organizations and paying so much attention, not just in Ukraine, but since we are talking about Ukraine, this is the Ukrainian conference, that's why the focus is on Ukraine. The primary reason is to make sure that as a result of our educational and technology transfer processes, not just training, but training followed by skill building, by coaching, mentoring, and all other necessary, necessary steps, we will start paying attention to this type of the population. The population that could have been helped much before severe problems have developed and they joined these five to 10% of people with very severe problems. I would like to thank you for your attention. I hope we'll have a chance to work with you when, when all this COVID craziness is over and we will be able to travel. I would, probably the first thing I will do, I will jump on a plane and we'll come to Kiev, to Ukraine, and hopefully we'll see you in person. We'll continue our work. Again, I want to thank all of you for the fantastic work you are doing, for the conference that you put together despite all of these difficulties. I want to thank particularly Dr. Pinchuk and Dr. Yachnik for their tremendous amount of work they have done. I wish you all success. Be good to yourself, take good care of each other, and hopefully we'll see each other soon. Thank you very much. Good luck. All the best. Bye-bye.